the Trinity, not a Bible teaching. Well, I think in many respects it's a little disappointing really, isn't it, that we have to in any way have any doubts in our mind about the form and the personage of Almighty God. And when you think about our title tonight, the the fact that we have to actually challenge the basic concept of who God is and his formation, the character of God, the purpose of God is bound up in all that he is, the fact that we uh, tonight have to discuss that just goes to show how sad it is that so few people understand clearly who God is in his entirety. But you know, like everything else I think in the world, people enjoy a challenge, don't they? They enjoy challenging what seems to be the standard. It seems to be this natural desire to go beyond what uh, you simply read on the surface, and to delve into it, look perhaps for uh, things that are hard to understand, and question, maybe even put a bit of mystery around things. And in so many ways, I think people thrive on that idea, enjoy the mystery of something. Um, you know, it's, it's too simple otherwise, it's too clear. And it's a message that quite often comes to us from other religions. Quite often it's, you know, you can't simplify it. It's too difficult to understand. It's, it's a special message that comes from God and you can't begin to understand it. And so there is this this whole world out there of trying to discover the riddles of of the Bible, the mysteries of the things that are hidden. And it doesn't take you long by doing a little bit of research with the ability we have today to be able to very quickly see that there's all sorts of ideas out there, all sorts of random thoughts. There's no end to what could be and may be and everybody's got their own little agenda that they're pushing. And it's absolutely no different in religion, of course. I think we can safely say that most religions of the world are based on some form of hidden messages or some sort of mystery, some way in which the message isn't clear. And you're going to have to trust me that I'm going to tell you the truth. And probably a lot of times uh, you're going to have to do more than trust. You might even have to pay for it. Well, you know, I think one of the classic examples that comes home in recent or modern history, really, in the last probably 30, 40 years, was the advent of Nostradamus, or the, the discovery, I should say, probably, of Nostradamus. And many of the younger ones might not be aware of him. But it wasn't that long ago when all of a sudden everybody discovered that this, uh, this fellow Nostradamus made all these wonderful predictions. And everybody suddenly realised that they might be coming to pass, they might be coming true. And there was this big flurry of knowing what he was about, what he'd said and what he'd discovered. And it turned out that really when you had a look at him, what he'd written, and he'd lived uh, a couple hundred years ago, what he had actually written was based on scripture. But worse still, when you read what he'd written, it wasn't even clear and you couldn't really decipher what he was determining. So that it was really left to open interpretation. It was a little bit mysterious. It was this gobbledygook language, if you like, whereby you could get all excited about what he was maybe saying. It's a classic example, I think, of how easy it is within religion to not really hit home at the Bible truths. And for that reason tonight we are using our Bibles for a Bible lecture. We can see what it clearly says and let's have a look at the passages and let's see what the Bible tells us. I think often God is hidden, isn't he, from our understanding. He's a hidden being. We don't really know who he is. We can't get close to him. And you'll never understand what God wants from you. And really that's just an ignorance of the scriptures. And I hate to say it as bluntly as that, but it really is. It's an ignorance of understanding what God has carefully defined in Scripture for us to understand. And I suppose that in some ways there's there's a feeling of power, isn't there? When people know things that are, you know, a bit hard for you to understand. I know it, but, you know, I'm sorry, but you're just never going to be able to grasp it. And there's that little bit of authority, that little bit of power over someone else when you have that knowledge that you'll never be able to get. Well, when I looked at our title tonight, I thought, I don't really want to spend a lot of time talking about the idea of where the Trinity came from and the the history of that, because I think our purpose with our Bible lectures is to really define for you what the Bible teaches is correct. And I think you'll find that if we go through tonight and look at our passages and explain the Scriptures, we'll be quite satisfied of what the Scripture is clearly telling us. And based on that, if you then want to go and have a look and find out a bit more about the origins of the teachings of the Trinity, you're more than welcome to. There's plenty of information out there and you'll get confused in no time at all. One of the first things we learn about God in the very beginning of Scripture is what he said in Genesis chapter 1. 
And he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And the purpose of man was to have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God from the very beginning had a purpose that man should have dominion. And in making man, he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, if you study scripture, you will find that the us and our is a direct reference to the work of the angels working on behalf of God. But as their representative, as God's representative, they clearly make a statement regarding who God is and what he is after. That he is after people that are like him. And doing a Bible study, you can very quickly reveal or discover that the meaning behind this is that God wants people who embrace his character into their lives. He wants to be seen in their, their likeness to be like his. And having created man and placed him on the earth with this intent, God then set about providing for man's needs. You'd expect it of the Father and you'd have thought that that's exactly what he would do. He wouldn't just put them on the earth and say, go for it and good luck. That's not what we know about God. And it's not what a, man, what a man would normally do for his children, is it? So we detailed some of the things that God did. He put Adam and Eve in a beautiful environment that he had made for them, the Garden of Eden, often referred to as the most beautiful place. It's often spoken of as paradise, isn't it? Referred to. He gave them safety by providing a secure garden. So within Eden, he put a garden in which they could be safe, where they knew that they could be able to tend to the garden day by day. He provided for them company, the male and the female together, that they together might form a relationship. And they formed a unique relationship together above all creation, one that was so totally different. They understood each other, they complemented each other. And God worked with them to teach them how to do that. We're told that he provided food in abundance. And all this, of course, is revealed in Genesis chapter 2. Food in abundance for their needs. He gave them the authority to name the other animals of creation, which is a wonderful privilege. He gave them laws that they had to live by so that they understood right from wrong. And he started educating them through the communication that he had with them on a daily process. All these things are normal. All the things that we would expect a parent to do when bringing children into the world. It's part of what our obligation is as parents. But how well do we know God? How much of your life have you spent answering the question of who really God is? Have you really spent time thinking about what he wants, what he's after? And I think tonight we're going to learn a little bit about that because we can't discover the real character of God or the, the fact that God is not a part of a trinity without understanding the real character of God. I think most people will admit that they uh, only occasionally think about God even today in their lives and less often do they try to find out anything about him. My experience with the people I work with is the only time God comes into it is when they need it, when they're in trouble and when they say they need to pray. And it's, I'm not sure what the, pray, the praying praying constitutes but it's pretty brief and uh, it's pretty quickly forgotten when the crisis is over but did you know that within scripture it's a fundamental requirement of God that we come to know him as a person that we come to know his character that's a fundamental requirement and I think that's an important thing to remember as we start tonight it's an absolutely essential thing that we know the character of God not just that he is God not just that he is in heaven not just that he's the almighty power, but, uh, but to understand who God really is. And if there's to be any chance of understanding anything about our lives and our purpose on the earth, how we fit into God's plans, we've got to find out what he wants from us. I'd like to turn to John chapter 17 to start with. The uh, words of the Lord Jesus Christ, and many of you will be very familiar with his words, as he, as he spoke this prayer to God, one of the final prayers that he uttered before his crucifixion. Very important chapter, and we're going to refer to it at another time a bit further on tonight. But initially, at the beginning of the chapter, where John's, uh, when John records the prayer of Christ, we read in John 17 and verse 1, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven, and he said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy Son, that the son, thy Son may glorify thee. And I want you to note that as we go through Scripture, you'll very clearly see that Christ 
whenever communicating with the Father, spoke to him as a separate person, not as if he was speaking to himself, which I know might sound rather strange. He says in verse 2, As thou hast given the Son power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. So Christ is now speaking about eternal life that Christ has the power to give it. And what we learn from that is that obviously eternal life is not a given. It's not just something we have. In fact, in verse 3, he says, this is life eternal. Here's the key to what life eternal is, he says. And what is it? That they might know thee, that they might know God, the only true God, and Jesus Christ who has been sent. On God's behalf. So here it is. It says, God's given him the power to extend eternal life. Therefore, we don't already have it. And he says, if you want the key to it, you've got to come to know the only true God. Now, there's a lot of gods out there. There's a lot of gods out there, and there's a lot of things to be worshipped. And he says here that you have, the Lord Jesus Christ says, you have to get to know who is the only true God. And not only that, you also have to get to know Jesus Christ, whom God has sent. And if God has sent him, and you want to know him, then you probably have to know why God has sent him, and we'll touch on that too. So the key out of this, these verses here is that life eternal is not something we take for granted. It's not something we have already. And there's something important to know about the character of God. I want to explore that a little bit by looking at some quotes. This is what the apostles wrote when they were preaching or extending the word of God to other people. They said, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel that I preached unto you. And I'm sure you're familiar with the term the gospel. This good news that Christ came to teach. He says, this gospel I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand. So you're in the gospel. By which also, he says, you are saved. This is interesting because we've been talking about eternal life. And the Apostle is saying that bound up in the Gospel is this ability to be saved. And the only thing we need to be saved from is death, isn't it? In the ultimate sense, if you want eternal life, you need to be saved from death. He says, this Gospel is able to give you that salvation. He goes on to say that, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you. What does he say he preached unto you? He says, oh, I declare unto you the Gospel which I preached unto you. If you keep that in memory, he said, then you are able to be saved. Again, he reiterates it in verse 3. I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. So now we're starting to learn a little bit, aren't we? We're starting to find out that the Gospel is about being saved. And bound up in that, what he delivered to them was how Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Now, that's complemented when we go and look at Romans chapter 1. The Apostle wrote, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Now, here we have that reference again, don't we, to the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why not? Because it is the power of God unto salvation. It is the power that God has given us to be saved. How? To everyone that believes, whether you're a Jew or whether you're a non-Jew. To anyone who believes, the gospel is the power of God to be saved. It's the power of God to bring you to eternal life. So there's some, a couple of quotes that are very powerful really in their own right, aren't they? When they, they reveal to us God's purpose. And bound up in that purpose is the work of Christ. It's the gospel of Christ. And it's very clearly segregated from the power of God unto salvation. Christ came to preach the gospel. In that is the power of God as a separate identity. And what was the purpose of Christ? We've already read that it was that he, through the crucifixion, through his own death, should be able to bring forth salvation to mankind. Look at the words that he uttered to one of the elders, Nicodemus, one of the elders in the land at the time. He said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So the Lord's referring back to an incident in the wilderness when the children of Israel were plagued by serpents. And Moses was told by God to put a serpent on a stake. And by looking at that serpent, they could be saved. And there was a lesson behind that because Christ said, in the same way, the Son of Man, or himself he's talking about, had to be lifted up, to put on a stake. 
Why? That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We've just spoken about eternal life, haven't we? And that Jesus has just said that to know God is part of eternal life. Now he's telling us that to understand and believe in Christ is to have eternal life. But look what he says here in verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So God's the one that's given the son. It doesn't say God has given himself. It doesn't say that God gave a part of himself. It says God, for his love for the world, gave his only begotten son in order that those who believe in him would have everlasting life. God didn't send his son in the world to condemn the world, but that he might be able to save people. So God very clearly had a purpose in providing Christ. Very clearly then, Christ was a part of that purpose. He was independent of God himself. He had to be in order that he could work out the salvation of God's purpose. I think God giving his, his son is hardly the language of son being God himself, is it? Well, what's the scriptural teaching about God? Let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And most of us will be familiar again with Deuteronomy 6. But let's have a look at what it tells us because it's, it's important to understand the way in which Things are reiterated in scripture. Here's a consistent message of the Old Testament. And you might say, well, it's interesting to be in the Old Testament because the Old Testament is being done away with. There's now the New Testament and the New Testament's replaced the Old Testament. You know, we've got a God of love now, not the God of judgment in the, in the Old Testament. But if you really study your Bible, you'll come to understand that the Old Testament is essential to understand the New Testament. And it in actual fact complements the purpose of God when you go through the thread of the scripture. So in Deuteronomy 6, we read in verse 1, Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that you might do them in the land whither you go to possess it. So the children of Israel have left Egypt. They're on the way up to the land of Israel. And Moses says, you know, this is important. Look at the things he says here. There's the commandments of God. There's the statutes of God. There's the judgments of God. And God wants you to be taught them, he says. Because you've got to do them when you get into the land. It's important that you understand what to do. In verse 2, that you might fear or reverence, as it should be, the Lord your God. To do what? Oh, we're going to hear it again. To keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, thy sons and thy sons' sons, all the days of your life, that thy days may be prolonged. So he's now repeated it, hasn't he? He said it's important that you do this. Because it will give you length of life. God will bless you. Verse 3. Listen, hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it. Not just hear it, but do it. Why? That it may be well with thee. And that you may increase mightily, as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, in the land that God's promised, flowing with milk and honey. It's very clear that this is important, what Moses is about to say. He's really stressed it in three verses here, hasn't he? There's a, a fundamental blessing behind what he has to say. In verse 4, the first thing he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And then he goes on to say, you, you have to learn to love your Lord to God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And the words that I command you this day, you need to keep it in your heart. You've got to teach it, he says in verse 7, to your children. You've got to be, it's got to be a part of your life. Because there's only one way you can come to know God, and that's if he is a part of your life. How do you know your best friend? Your best friend in life is a person that you come to know. You spend time with them, you, you talk to them, you understand what they like and what they don't like. You are good friends. And the only way you can get to know God is on a similar basis. You've got to understand what he likes and why, and what it is that he's after. And Moses was stipulating here strongly to the children of Israel that they understood that. And the first thing he says it's important to know is that there's only one God. Now he's saying that on the back of their experience that they've just had for several hundred years in Egypt. They've just come out of Egypt. Moses has delivered them by the hand of God. And in Egypt, everything that you looked at was a God. In fact, if you go through the, the plagues in Exodus, before they were released from Egypt, you'll find that 
Systematically, God attacked every single thing that they worshipped as a God. And Moses' father-in-law, when he came to see him in the wilderness, said exactly that. He said, in the things that the Egyptians dwelt proudly in, God reduced them in their humility. God showed them that there were no gods. They were just the, the imagination of their hearts. There's only one God. The Lord our God is one Lord. Very clear. And that's consistent teaching in Scripture. And why would God record that? Why would he stress the importance of this if it wasn't true? Why would he go through the detail of those first three verses, clearly enunciating what it is, what's important, and then making that statement straight from the front? Could it be that God wants to be absolutely clear about who he is? He wants us to make no mistakes about what he's after as we make our study of the scriptures. Well, we've just read in Mark, our chairman's read for us Mark chapter 12, so let's go there because you will recognise that Mark chapter 12, there's a section there where Christ actually quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 6. And again, as I said to you, the Old Testament and the New Testament are complementary. You cannot live one without the other if you want to know the truth of the Bible. And if you do so with a clear mind, a questioning heart to understand God's purpose. So what happens we find in verse, uh, Mark 12 and verse 28. One of the scribes came and having heard the Lord reasoning with the, the groups that were there, and perceiving that he had answered them well, he said to Christ, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, and he quotes Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. The second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. There is no other commandments greater than these. So the greatest two commandments are here portrayed for us. Not only do we know that our Lord, the Lord God is one God, but notice that the, the, the addendment, or the hanging on the back of that in verse 30, is the instruction to love the Lord your God. You to do it with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. We read that in Deuteronomy 2. So it's not just that we got to know God. We actually have to learn to love him. You can't love God unless you know what he's about. That's something that takes time. It takes a little while to delve in and find out what God's about. But interestingly for us, in verse 32, the scribe who's asked this question of Christ, he acknowledges the truth of it. He says, well, Master, thou hast said the truth. There is one God and there is none other but he. He reiterates the truth of it. And he talks about the essentiality of loving him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your soul, all your strength. He even says to love your neighbour as yourself is more than whole burnt offerings and sacrifices under the law. Not only did he agree with Christ, but Christ then says in verse 34, well, it records for us in verse 34, that Jesus, when he saw this answer, he said, you're not far from the kingdom of God. You're not far from getting eternal life, which is, of course, the only, thing you, the only way you can get into the kingdom of God. Jesus was pleased with this answer. He saw it as a fundamental truth. Now, if Jesus was a part of God and he was one of the three, surely he would be challenging that. Surely he would say, well, he'd be saying, well, let me set you straight. You're, you're reading from the Old Testament and that's not, no longer correct because we, you know, we, just, we just said that because that's what we said back then. We don't say that anymore. We're actually, uh, we've changed things a bit. There was nothing of that sort, was there? Well, Master, thou hast said the truth. There is one God. And Jesus is pleased with the answer. There's no way in which Christ, if you examine him and understand his preaching, was ever going to falsely represent God on this earth. And did the scribe, when he had finished this conversation with Christ, did he leave this conversation believing that Jesus was part of God himself? Did he leave this thinking that he'd just spoken for one of the Trinity, one member of the Trinity? Would he be eligible to enter into the kingdom of God, thinking that God was one of three and that he was actually confused with the fundamental understanding of the first commandment? I don't think so. Have a look at what the apostles taught as they went about preaching the truth. Paul told Timothy, he said, there is one God and there's one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. This is written after Christ has resurrected and gone to the Father. 
There's one God, he says. There's only one God. He says there's one mediator between God and men. And in the scripture, a mediator is between God and men is always takes the message from God to man. Never from man to God. So Christ is that mediator and he's defined as the man Jesus. Very clearly. Here he is sitting on the right hand of God and he's still the man Jesus. Not the God Jesus. Not the man God. Not the son God. Not anything else you want to call it. And why was Paul so clearly telling Timothy here that Christ Jesus was the man because he understood him and his purpose to be the man who brought salvation to the earth again in Acts 2 ye men of Israel hear these words Jesus of Nazareth after he's resurrected a man approved of God God approved him he didn't approve himself he needed approval from God and he was approved by the miracles and wonders and signs that he did God did them by him in the midst of you. God gave him the power to do those things in their midst. And he says, you know that. You saw it. You witnessed it. You saw that he was a man that was approved of God to do the miracles that God had allowed him to do. He's very clear on that. Further on in Acts, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with that power. And he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. And why do we have to know that if he is God? And why do we have to know that God was with him if he already was God? It's a, it's a given, isn't it? It's, an under, it's something we would be foolish not to understand. And God actually anointed him with the Holy Spirit. He didn't have it already. If he was part of the Trinity and the Holy Spirit was, he would be part of it. He didn't need to be anointed. He didn't need God to do anything. Or is it perhaps that the apostles had it all wrong when they went out to preach the gospel? And they didn't clearly understand how Christ would fit in with the Godhead. A bit further on in 1 Corinthians, and I'm just giving you a few to think about. Unto us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we are in him. And there's one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. And so there's God, the Father, of whom are all things, but then there is the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have that hope, by whom we have the promise, by his gospel we had the ability to come near to God he says how be it there is not in every man that knowledge there's not that understanding the apostles were dealing with people who didn't clearly understand the purpose of God in his son we need to be clear on it. Ephesians 4 one God and father of all who is above all and through all and in you all it's pretty clear isn't it and within scripture I can find no reference no reference at all to God being more than one a part of a triune Godhead. I can see no reference. It always speaks of Jesus as the Son who never had the authority of the Father. Very clearly defines that Jesus did not have the authority of his Father. In fact, at his crucifixion, when Christ was about to be crucified, one of the most agonising moments of his life that he had to deal with, and as a man, when he had to face death, and a terrible death, as he agonised with that, he, uh, he had to deal with the fact that he was fulfilling the will of his father. And he speaks very clearly of the fact that he had a separate will. Matthew 26 says, Jesus went a little further and fell on his face and he prayed saying, O oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not, not what I want, but as you want, as you will. In other words, for him it was a desperate period of time, but he understood that the will of God was essential to be upheld. And he was praying for the strength to do that. And there's no way if he was part of God that he could have a different will to what God had. His will was based on preservation of the flesh, which is what we all are naturally, um, what is it, geared to do. We are naturally preserving life. We, well, nobody wants to die. And that was something that was built into Christ as well. It was a difficult thing to face. At the most important part of his life, he prays in great earnestness to God, requesting something of him because of the struggle that he was experiencing. There's no way he wanted to give in to his own will, and he never did. You know, it's quite normal for a son to have a different will to his father, isn't it? But it wouldn't be normal if he was the one and the same person. You know, it's a very common mistake to misapply the statements of Christ as well. I'm going to go to John chapter 10. Because the, the children of Israel, the Jews in Christ's day, were guilty of doing the same thing. They misquoted Christ. 
They accused him of the same things, of being part of God that they didn't understand. In John chapter 10, and in verse, uh, verse 27, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life. Again, part of Christ's mission was to bring the opportunity of eternal life. And he says, They shall never perish, these sheep of mine, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand, if they are in the protection of Christ. Verse 29, my father gave me them. My father, sorry, which gave them me is greater than all. No man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. He says, God is the almighty being. But then he makes this statement in verse 30. I and my father are one. And it's a statement which can be very challenging for people who are seeing this on face value. Look at the Jews' reaction in verse 31. The Jews took up stones to stone him. And he responded in verse 32, Many good works have I showed you of my father. For which of those works do you stone me? And the Jews answered him saying, Oh, for a good work we won't stone you, but because of blasphemy, because you, being a man, have made yourself God. And he hadn't, had he? He actually said that I and my father are one because he was talking about the purpose of God. He was standing there before them talking about the way in which he was working to bring people to eternal life. That was God's purpose. That's what he was there for. Look at verse 36. He says, Say ye of whom whom the Father, him of whom the Father has sanctified. Talking about himself in the third person. Do you say of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent in the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. Jesus had never said he was God the Son. He had always said he was the Son of God. But he and his father were at one mind. They were of one purpose. And the Jews made the mistake of not listening carefully to what he had to say. We can't afford to make the same mistake. John 17, we've just uh, looked at it. We'll go back to it. I said we'd come back to it. In John 17, further on in the prayer, when the Lord Jesus Christ was again appealing to the Father for the safety of his disciples. And in verse um, John 17 and verse 18... He says to God, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent those disciples into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. He says in verse 20, I'm not praying for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Anybody who believes on his word he prays for. Verse 21 is interesting. He says, Why? I'm praying that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. Now, if you were taking this on face value and literally as they did in John 10, you would say, well, Christ is teaching that we can be part of the Trinity. But of course he's not. He's talking about singleness of purpose and mind, isn't he? He has to be when he talks about all those that are yet to believe that they might be of one mind, of one purpose, fulfilling what God has required of them. When we understand that, it changes the understanding of Scripture right through. Because then we begin to understand that God and Jesus were perfectly unified in their purpose. Christ came to achieve something which his Father had sent him for. And he was absolutely determined to achieve it. He had that singleness of mind. And he wants you and I to have the same singleness. He wants you and I to be devoted to doing God's will. He wants you and I to be of the same mind as God. And you can't do that if you don't know what God's mind is. How could Jesus be praying to the Father here if he was God himself anyway? What's he doing? Is he asking himself for himself? It's an absolute foolishness. Interestingly, when you look at James chapter 1, James says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted of evil, neither tempteth he any man. When we're introduced to the ministry of Christ, we're told that he was tempted for 40 days. And yet we're also told that God cannot be tempted with evil. There's absolutely no doubt that Christ was not God. Otherwise, the temptation wouldn't have had no effect on him. God cannot be tempted. Again in Mark 15, as the Lord was on the cross, in the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted... My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? 
And here's Jesus praying to God as a separate individual to God. Why would he call out to God in his deepest need if it was calling out to himself? Why would he call out to God for help in many ways if he was the only one that could help himself? Let's have a look at uh, Mark chapter 13 because the work that the Lord did in his life was designed to support the Father, his Father, in every way. What I'm really bringing home to you is the importance of Christ's purpose and his mission in complementing what God wanted. And when you understand that, you understand how foolish it is to understand that God could ever be part of a trinity. Mark 13 and verse um, 32, the Lord's talking about the, the kingdom on earth and the time in which God will intervene. But he says to the disciples in verse 32, of the day and the hour that God will do this, he says, knoweth no man, not even the angels that are in heaven, neither me, the Son, but the Father only. He clearly says here, there's no person, there's no angels, there's no Son that knows the purpose of God for this time but the Father. The only one that knows the time when this will take place is God himself. And we, reach, we see that again in Acts chapter 1. Again, let's go to that. But I'm sure you're familiar with the words of Acts 1 where the apostles, after Christ had risen, they asked him and said, are you going to set up the kingdom now? We know that you're going to be the king of all the earth. Are you about to do it? What's the timing? And he tells them, well, again, it's only the Father that knows this. Verse 6 of Acts 1. When they were therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you again at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Are you going to do it now? We know that's what it's about. And he said unto them, he didn't say, oh, what kingdom? What are you talking about? No, he didn't say that. He said, I can't tell you the time or the seasons. That's in the Father's power. That's what God has in his power. It's not for you to know these things. And very clearly, Jesus was saying to them, there are things that God has in control that are yet to be revealed to him. So how could he be considered part of God himself? I think the only way we can do that is if we don't read the scriptures carefully. If we don't understand the simple concept of Jesus representing his father when he worked on earth. In fact, the apostles taught that God was actually in Christ fulfilling his purpose. So that in itself, if you don't understand this, is confusing. 2 Corinthians 5. We're told that to wit, or that is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them. And he has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So here's the work of God in Christ. Christ has already said, I came to do my Father's will. I don't speak anything unless it's the words of my Father. They're the things he said. And so God, the apostle says, God was working in Christ to reconcile the world to himself. Christ was the tool that he used in order to achieve that outcome. And then further, the apostle says in Hebrews 2, that God, Christ was a man like us, wherefore in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. There it is, the Lord Jesus Christ was made like unto us, and that he was a man and not God himself. One of, the, um, one of the passages from the Lord Jesus Christ in which he refers... Well, we might look John chapter 3. Yes. John chapter 3, the Lord said, For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth him not the Spirit by measure unto him. So the Lord Jesus Christ says, Well, God sent me. He's like a messenger. I've come to speak the word of God. And God has given me the, the Holy Spirit, the power of God, to be able to do that in, in actually in every ability that God can give him. And so the Lord himself recognised that the power of God was within him to achieve God's outcome, not his. So when we know the scripture, when we understand how there is this difference between God and the Son, we understand perfectly how God is a Father, but he cannot be a part of a trinity. And so where does our obligation lie? What is it that we do with this information? Well, John chapter 4, the Lord said to the woman of Samaria when he was talking to her, he said, The hour comes, and now is, when true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father 
seeks such to worship him. In plain language, he's saying the thing that God wants is for people to worship him honestly, in spirit and in truth, because he's seeking them. He's looking for them. He's looking for people who want to search him out themselves and that they worship him in the right way. He doesn't say God's looking for people that worship us. Uh, God's looking for people that understand uh, the three of us. He doesn't say that. God is looking for those that worship him as a father. And not just as a God, but as a father. Someone who loves them and brings them up as his children. You know, when the, the angel came to Mary before she gave birth to Christ, he spoke to her about Christ being the king on the throne of David. And he made references to the promises that God had made to King David, that one day there would be a king on his throne, ruling over all the earth. It's a, it's a promise, it's a fundamental belief in scripture. It's one that everybody in Israel believed in. Every person understood the promises to David. They were all waiting for this Messiah to come. They all hoped for that day when he would be there. Romans 15, Paul says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision, or the Jews, for the truth of God, to confirm the promises that were made under the fathers. Bound up in the work of Christ was to confirm those promises. He fulfilled the words of that angel when he spoke to Mary. It was the completion of those promises. And yet he still has to come in order to establish that throne of David to fulfil that promise in its entirety. And the Apostle Paul taught after the Lord's resurrection that those promises have been confirmed. But we have yet to see them outworked. And we saw in John 3 that the Lord has to be, or had to be lifted up. He had to be crucified. Again, that was an essential part of God's redemptive work if we are to be saved. That's another subject in itself. But through his perfect life, through Christ's willing death, if we associate with those things, we too can see the opportunity of salvation. Matthew 28, the Lord said to the disciples, he said, I want you to go and teach all nations. I want to baptise them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, teaching people to observe all things, whatever I've commanded you. Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the earth. And notice how he differentiates between those three. In the name of God the Father, in the name of the Son that came to do his work, and in the name of the Holy Spirit who is revealed in scriptures to be the power of God. And we have to do all things. We have to do all things observing God's commandments. And there's an instruction now that brings it home personally to us. There's a personal instruction now. You understand who God really is. You know briefly that God came, that Christ came to do the purpose of God and bound up in that is a lot of detail. But you have enough information now to know that God requires of you to act upon that. Look at the words of the Apostle when he spoke to the Corinthians. And I, this is one of my favourite quotes and I've got it in the dialogue so that hopefully it's a bit easier to understand. Paul says, Christ didn't send me to baptise but to announce the glad tidings, otherwise known as the gospel. Not in wisdom of speech so that the cross of Christ may be frustrated. For this word, that is the preaching of the cross, is indeed foolishness to those people who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, even to us, that's the power of God. So there's two categories of people. There are those who are perishing and there are those who are being saved. You're in a state of either perishing or you're in a state of being saved. You're only in two categories. Where do you find yourself? He says that word of the cross, the crucifixion of Christ, is foolishness to people who are, are going to die. They're just passing away. There's no hope for them because it's stupidity. They don't see the wisdom of God in what he did. But for those people who are being saved, those people who are putting their life into it, who've come to know God and the purpose that he had, the wisdom of bringing Christ into the world. For those people we see the power of God in what he did by sending his son. That's the power of the word of God if you let it live in your life. Where do you classify yourself? I'm sure none of you would think that you are perishing without a hope. I'm sure you all think that you're in that situation where you're being saved. But you need to be clear about that. Just sitting comfortably in your seat doesn't guarantee anything. We've only touched tonight on our subject briefly, I think. 
hopefully I've done enough to invigorate in you some taste of what the scripture does really say. We've got an absolute belief in what scripture consistently teaches. Bible truth is essential. There's enough information in here to answer all your questions. There's exciting things in here that are essential for your salvation if you're willing to understand the truth of the Bible. I'd like to come to John chapter 8 and think of lastly close with the words of our Lord in John 8. The Lord looking ahead to the time when they would indeed take out their frustration on him by crucifying him, as he said, lifted up, as they lifted up that serpent. It says in John 8 verse 28, Then said Jesus unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am he, and that I do nothing by myself. But as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. This is some of the words of Christ which are very challenging, aren't they? Because he says, when you crucify me, that's when you're going to come to understand this. And there were people at his crucifixion who were caused to say, truly, this is the Son of God. Verse 29, he that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone. I do always those things that please him. What an incredible statement to make. No wonder he said, I and the Father are one. I do everything to please him. And as he spake these words, many people believed on him. They were moved enough to see the truth of what he spoke. It should really move us to do the same, shouldn't it? He said to those Jews in verse 31 which believed on him, those people who believed, he said, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you'll know the truth. You'll know the absolute truth of God's purpose. You'll know the truth of Christ's coming. The truth of Christ's plan of salvation through the work, the work of Christ through God. And you'll know that the truth will make you free. It will make you free from condemnation. Free from all the foolishness of this world which wants you to believe in all the mysteries that take you away from God. I hope you have enough in which to excite yourself to explore the word of God and look for your own salvation.